Hi, everyone. We're going to start the webinar now. So I just want to first start off by thanking everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rutter, the Director of Public Relations for American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC. This webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. And there will be links throughout the presentation and those will be on the chat as well as on our website and in a follow up email. So in case we go too quickly or you can't copy those, don't worry, we'll be sure you get that information. And as I mentioned, this is a webinar being recorded. So only the speakers actually have video and audio capabilities right now. We want to make sure you have the best viewing uh, opportunities as possible. So thank you for understanding. Um, Please make sure that you use that Q&A chat box. We'll try and get to all of those questions at the end during a special Q&A session. Um, and again, if you don't get your question answered, feel free to reach out to us afterwards and we'll make sure you get that information. So just a little background. American Bird Conservancy was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. We continue that work today following the conservation strategy that is outlined in this pyramid on the screen right now. Our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. It's the tip of that pyramid that you see on the, on the screen right now that this webinar will focus on. You'll hear from our panelists about work to find species that haven't been documented for some time and our efforts to ensure that we don't lose those birds forever. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. First up is John C. Mittemeyer. He is ABC's Director of Threatened Species Outreach. He's had a lifelong interest in birds and bird conservation and has led several projects to search for lost bird species in places such as Samoa, Indonesia, and the Solomon Islands. Prior to joining ABC, he received a PhD in biodiversity science from the University of Oxford. He's an avid birder and has seen more than 5,000 species of birds around the world. Next up is Eliana Fierro, who is an International Conservation Project Officer at ABC. Born and raised in Colombia, Eliana has been working for the conservation of threatened and endemic bird species and their habitats in the Andes and the Pacific coast of Colombia. She is author of the conservation plans of four endangered bird species, as well as many books and other outreach materials. Eliana has also participated in several field research projects in Borneo, Ecuador, and the U.S. We also have Albert Aguirre joining us, who is a Brazilian ornithologist and has been working on the conservation of threatened birds in the last four years as a project coordinator at Save Brazil. Birds are his passion, which is his guiding his career. Previously, he has worked as an ornithologist consultant in environmental studies and achieved his master's degree in animal biology and a specialization in environmental management. Albert truly believes in the power of people to solve nature's conservation problems. He is now committed to saving the blue-eyed ground dove, which you'll hear about. It's one of the rarest bird species in the world with local communities and the help of technology. So first up will be John. Great. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Jordan. And hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see where you all are chiming in from and joining us. So as Jordan said, my name's John, and today I'd just like to introduce you a little bit to our Lost Birds program and also give you a bit of background on why I find Lost Birds to be such an exciting and interesting topic. So with that, uh, first slide, please. So if any of you are bird watchers, you'll be very familiar with these kinds of maps. These are distribution maps, and they show us where species like long-eared owls or cerulean warblers can and cannot be found. And I have to say for me personally, I've always found these maps one of the most interesting things about studying birds. It's really exciting to kind of think about how different bird species fit into the landscape, why they happen to be in some places and not others. And I also have always kind of enjoyed thinking about the stories behind how these maps are made. You know, I don't know if you look closely, but you can see that long-eared owl. There's a little patch of purple in the middle of Iowa. Um, how did someone find out that little bit of information? Were they out there surveying, surveying owls and sort of solving that little mystery? Next slide, please. So given my kind of background interest in maps, I can remember exactly the moment that I first saw this map. Uh, this bird is the Makira moorhen, and the map you see here is the island of Makira in the eastern Solomon Islands. And those question marks are pretty much everything we know about the distribution of the Makira moorhen. This bird was last definitely recorded in 1953, and since then it's basically become a total mystery. 
We know it occurred on the island of Makira, but we don't know where exactly. And to be honest, at this point, we don't even know if this bird still exists. And if it has disappeared, we're not entirely sure why. So I, th I think this map with these question marks on it sort of gets to the, the core of what Lost Birds is about and highlights what, what makes some of this topic sort of so intriguing and interesting. These are birds that are just beyond the limits of our knowledge as scientists and conservationists. And they're birds, sort of these, these detective stories, these mysteries that we don't know quite enough about to even be able to begin to study them or try to conserve them. So if you're like me and you're looking at this map and you're feeling intrigued and, and maybe a little bit inspired, then I think lost birds is gonna be a topic that you find really exciting and interesting. Next slide, please. So the Makira moorhen uh, is still a mystery. Nobody's found that bird yet. But there are a number of other bird species that have been found after going missing for decades or sometimes even centuries. One of these is the blue-eyed ground dove, which was rediscovered after 75 years in 2015. And Albert's going to tell you a little bit more about that incredible story shortly. Another one is this bird, the uh, black-browed babbler. And the announcement of the rediscovery of this bird actually just came out this morning. So literally today, this news was broken. This bird was rediscovered after more than 170 years. And the picture you're looking at right, right now is the only, the first ever photograph of this bird in life. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about that incredible story, I'd encourage you to uh, check out the recent press release on our website. Next slide, please. So there's an aspect of lost birds that's really sort of feels like a bit of a treasure hunt. It's this process of discovery, trying to find these species that are mysteries. But it's also really important to be aware that there's a, a critical conservation element to this as well. Many lost birds are endangered or critically endangered, and it's often virtually impossible to try and think about ways to conserve these species if we don't even know where they are. Furthermore, a lot of lost birds sort of unsurprisingly occur in areas that have been really poorly studied and efforts to go look for these species, you know, often detect really interesting facts about other species as well, whether they be birds, herps, uh, those are reptiles and amphibians, mammals, plants, etc. And finally, if we, if we do lost bird searches carefully, you know, these are things that can also really benefit conservation efforts uh, locally and regionally. And that can happen, you know, particularly if someone finds the bird, but also if done well, you know, they can benefit uh, conservation efforts even if these species aren't found. Next slide, please. So, you know, what, where does ABC fit into this? So be mindful of the, uh, of the conservation importance of lost birds. We at ABC have been working over the past few months to try and uh, bring together a lost birds initiative. And we've been working with some incredible partners on this, specifically Global Wildlife Conservation, who has an ongoing search for lost species, as well as eBird and BirdLife International. And we're trying to do sort of three things with this initiative. The first is just identify which birds are lost. The second is to highlight the lost birds that we think are most in need of conservation attention right now. And then finally, we wanna support projects to go search for these species and wherever possible, also try and develop conservation programs for them. Next slide, please. So today, I just wanna talk a little bit more about the, the first of those three points. How do we figure out which birds are lost? And while this may seem superficially straightforward, it's actually really a, a surprisingly difficult thing to do. And there are a couple, there are several different reasons for this. I'll just touch on two of them right now. One is, you know, lost birds are birds that we know almost nothing about often. And when you know so little about a species, sometimes it's hard to know if this is even a species or not, right? So, so we have some famous examples of birds that are known from only a single wing. Uh, and so you can imagine when all you have to work with is a wing, one wing that was found once by the side of the road, it's often hard to know, you know, is this even a real bird, much less where might it occur and how might we go about finding it? A second really important point around lost birds is, you know, these birds are lost. And so basically, you know, these birds are lost and it's hard to know if they're still out there. You know, species don't give us a, uh, a notification when they go extinct. Um, so often you don't really know if, if the bird is still there and worth searching for or whether it's already gone. And I think a sort of classic example of this at the moment is the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is a species that many of you will probably be familiar with. So here you can see a picture of it there. Uh, the ivory woodpecker is an absolutely spectacular species of woodpecker that once lived in the southeastern United States. People used to refer to it as the Lord God bird because apparently that's what, what people would exclaim when they first saw it because it was so incredible looking. Uh, many people have looked for this bird over the past 30 years. 
I think we would all like to hope that it's still out there somewhere, but at some point it's really hard to know whether or not this species is gone um, and whether it's worth continuing efforts to look for it. Next slide, please. So our approach that we've been using to try and figure out which species are lost really is based on this platform called eBird. And while we can't solve some of the hardest questions like whether or not the ivory-billed woodpecker is extinct with this, we can make a lot of progress in starting to identify species that are in need of more effort to search for them and to find out more about where they occur. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, eBird is a fantastic community science platform where bird watchers from around the world can, answer, can enter their, uh, their personal observations along with photographs and sound recordings. And it currently has over 600,000 users, nearly a billion bird observations. And just to give you a sense of how comprehensive this is, around 90% of all bird species in the world were reported to eBird in the last year. And that's despite all of us being locked down uh, during a pandemic. So the approach we've been using is saying, we've been working with the team at eBird, and we've been using their data to try and find all species in eBird that have not been reported in at least 10 years. Next slide, please. And as we've started doing this, we've come up with an initial list of around 150 species. And I want you to get too focused on this number of 150, because I just want to be clear that we're still revising this, and it's likely that this exact number is going to change a little bit as we keep working through the data. But one thing I really do want to be clear with and I want, to, I want you to pay attention to is just how relatively small this number is. This actually really shocked me when we first started looking at this. So there are between 10 and 11,000 species of birds around the world. This is, you know, between one and 2% of them that are currently lost. And so for me looking at this, you know, 150 is definitely a big challenge, but at the same time, I think this is something that's feasible. So you sort of look at this and say, all right, we potentially have this community of 600,000 or more people who can collaborate and work together on this. Let's go find these birds. I think this is something that we could potentially accomplish in the next five or 10 years, try and find all of the lost birds. And I think that'll be a real win for conservation if we can do that. Next slide, please. So that's just a little bit of background on what we've been doing and lost birds in general. And I also just wanna highlight some of the things to look forward to in this program in the coming year. So we have a number of field expeditions that we already have planned. Uh, one of those is actually happening right now. And you're about to hear more about that from Eliana in a moment. Uh, we're also working on developing a web platform where we're going to put up this list of lost birds and give you an opportunity to really explore it, see where some of these birds are located, see which ones you might be particularly interested in, and also contribute any information you might have about these species. And finally, you know, we're really seeing this Lost Birds project as, as a collaborative effort. I think it's something that we can all work together on, uh, and I think there will be a lot of opportunities to participate even for people who are not, you know, might not be interested in going out and searching for a bird in some uh, far flung location. You know, there's still a lot that you can, a lot of ways that you can help. Um, so we're really excited about all that and excited about working together on it. Next slide, please. So with that, I think I'll just finish up my introduction. Please uh, feel free to of course, drop any questions into the chat. And I think we're really looking forward to answering some of those and discussing them later on in this webinar. And of course, uh, you know, you'll be hearing from Eliana and Albert about their stories. And I also would encourage you to check out the websites of all of our partners and see some of the fantastic work that they're doing. And of course, you're, you're welcome to reach out to me as well if you have questions or more information. So thank you very much. Thanks, John. That was so fascinating and we can't wait to learn more again about all the updates from you as well as we're now going to hear from Eliana. We're digitally going to travel to Columbia, where she is talking about an ongoing search as we speak for this bird. So Eliana, please take it away. Yes, thank you, Jordan. Um, so I will tell you the little we know about the Sinu parakeet and the efforts we are making right now to search for the species in the north of Colombia. Next, please. So the Sinu parakeet is a medium-sized green parakeet and is very similar to other species of the genus Pirula. Um, it has like the sides of the face, the belly, and the tail red, dark red or maroon, and the throat and the chest is buffy white with scales. Um, the main difference with other Pirula, like the painted parakeet and periha parakeet, 
is the color of the shoulder. In these species is red and in the sinew parakeet is mostly green. Uh, the picture you are seeing right now is one of the last known specimens um, and is found in the Museum of Universidad del Cauca in Colombia. Next, please. According to the UCN, the Zinu parakeet is a critical endangered species and the population um, could be less than 50 individuals in the wild. However, the species have not been recorded in 70 years. And that's the reason it's considered a lost bird. Um, it used to be found in the dry forest of Cordoba State in the north of Colombia. Next, please. So there are only four localities with um, confirmed records of the species. Uh, the species was um, first seen in 1916 in a locality that nowadays is very close to the main city of Cordoba, Monteria. Um, you can see that's a point that is north in the map. And the last record was in 1949 in the foothills of the Serrania de San Jerónimo in an area known like Alto Sinú. Um, between 2004 and 2006, Fundación Pro Aves, a uh, partner of ABC in Colombia, did several uh, expeditions to look for the species in this area. Those are the red points that you can see in the map, but they couldn't find the species. Next, please. The main threat for the a uh, sinew parakeet is the deforestation. Like I told you before, they used to be found in the dry forest of Cordoba State. However, uh, this habitat has been lost since then due to agriculture, cattle pastures, illegal crop, and illegal logging. Um, this area actually has been very effective for the uh, civil conflict uh, between the illegal armed groups. And these restricted the access to the area and the possibility to develop any studies or conservations in Alto Sinú. Next, please. So uh, for you to have an idea how bad is the forestation, uh, in the last century, 98% of the tropical dry forest in Colombia has been lost. And specifically in the area where the Sinú parakeet could be found, that is the little circle you see in these maps, more than 90% of the forest have disappeared. Next. <clears throat> so the story of our expedition starts in 2019. Global Wildlife Conservation start working with local partners like Asociación Calidris and National Parks to plan an expedition to Alto Sinú for to look for the species. Uh, they actually tried to visit the area a couple of times since then, but it wasn't possible. Simultaneously, the Sociedad Ornitológica de Córdoba was, was working with their local partners and the local community to develop um, a study in the same area, not specifically to look for the parakeet, but to know more about the uh, bird community. Like I mentioned before, it's an area that uh, had restricted access for a long time, and there's not a lot of knowledge for the biodiversity. In 2020, American Bird Conservancy and Global Wildlife Conservation uh, came together to support these uh, initiatives with their programs of lost birds and lost species. And by the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, all the partners came together to uh, plan one big expedition to look for the species in Cerro Murrucucu in Alto Sinú. Next, please. Um, these are all the partners that right now are participating in the expedition, Sociedad Ornitológica de Córdoba, Asociación Calidris, National Parks, URA Hydroelectric Power Plant, Colombia Birding, Vortex Optics, Café Córdoba, and Urabá Nature Tours. Of course, it is worth to mention that the local community is playing a huge part in this group of people. They don't have a logo, but they are there. Um, they, run, they are actually the guides that are 
leading this expedition into Cerro Morrococo. Next, please. So this expedition that is currently ongoing uh, started last Saturday, February 20th, and is going to March 3rd. So only after this date we will we'll know how was it and if they actually could find the parakeet or not. Um, these are some of the pictures that they sent last weekend when they still had reception. <laughs> you can see in the left top, um, the Cerro, the actual tip of Cerro Murrucucu, and a little bit of the landscape in the right side. Uh, of course, they are also taking advantage of the expedition to look uh, for other biodiversity, so other birds and even amphibians and reptiles. And you can see um, the picture down there. Um, next, please. I just want to share with you a little video they sent of the team. So. Hey, how is it going? We are here on the Cerro Murrococu. It's a beautiful landscape. And this amazing team of people. Hey, guys. Oh, my no, God. <laughs> There is, there is this amazing team of people, national parks, local societies, NGOs, birders, ornithologists. Everyone is looking here for the Sinu parakeet. We are a thousand meters above sea level and there's a beautiful, beautiful landscape back there. So, wish us luck, guys. Hi. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, next. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much what I wanted to tell you. This last picture is to show you all the people that is right now in the field looking for the species. And thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, Eliana. Uh, we all have our fingers crossed. And for those watching, we will definitely keep you posted. So stay tuned and follow ABC online. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now as we uh, switch over to Albert, who will now be taking us again digitally, if only we could all go to Brazil and see the blue-eyed ground dove. Okay, uh, thank you, Jordan. I would like to thank you, ABC, for the invitation and for the opportunity to tell you a story of loss and hope. And okay, this is the blue and ground dove, Columbina cyanops, one of the rarest birds in the world. Uh, it remained unseen for 75 years. For a long period, the blue and ground dove was just known from drawings like this one. And also when specimens deposited in museums, just eight individuals were collected in more than 100 years. And this shows that the species was always rare. To put uh, into perspective, this timeline shows the individuals deposited in museums. And Johan Natteret collected the first individuals in the 19th century. Van Pausen described the species based on Natteret's collection 43 years later. And then, 33 years later, Ernst Garb obtained a male specimen uh, hundreds of kilometers far from Natteret's. His son, Walter Garb, collects a pair 30 years. 38 years afterwards, afterwards. And this is how the blind ground of history is told in a map from BirdLife slash UCN. The three red dots show the species historical occurrence and the purple one shows a vast area predicted for its occurrence with no sightings despite several searches for dozens of birders and ornithologists uh, that was looking for the species while conducting his activities and jobs. And this is, was until 2015, when the ornithologist Rafael Bessa found the species by chance in Botomirim, in Minas Gerais. He made the first documented record since 1945. The new map now shows the species living in an area more than a thousand kilometers from its last signs. And you can see the magnifying glasses showing the area outside the purple and predicted area. The species uh, retrospect help us to understand its current status as critically endangered, mainly uh, attributed to its small population size. In Brazil, 
the species was considered to be possibly extinct until 2014. Months after the rediscovery, we started a conservation project which resulted in the creation of the Blue Iron Ground of Nature Reserve in 2017. And we have also supported uh, the Butamarin State Park creation. Combined, more than 36,000 hectares are legally now protected. Butamarin was considered an important bird area in 2006. The protected area helps also to conserve other relevant bird species in the region. And we have been researching since 2016 to solve a lot of questions that we need to know to protect the species better. Where, how many, why, what, uh, we, are work, we are working to understand population estimates, foraging and reproductive behavior, habitat characterization, the search for new occurrence areas and its threats, besides other relevant questions, which includes coordinated searches at the species historical distribution in the states of Mato Grosso, highlighted uh, in blue, also in Goiás, highlighted in red, and also locations with habitat similarity in Minas Gerais, where the species now lives. And most recently, following and validate the species distribution model, in other words, computer algor alg algorithms to predict where the species could be found according to its preferences. The searches are being made inside the Botomirim State Park and more widely in Cerrado. To date, we have found the species at one of the predicted sites so far. We are also using autonomous recorders and semi-autonomous voice recognition software to search for new occurrence areas and verify how the species uses uh, its habitat. However, the current null population is about 33 individuals and thus ex situ ex strategies uh, to conserve the species were discussed during a workshop held in 2019 with 29 experts from 19 institutions and supported by American Bird Conservancy. We also had help from the UCN Conservation Planning Specialist Group at this workshop, which guided our search for the best solutions regarding species conservation. After further discussions, it became clear that an insurance population is the patch to follow which the blue iron ground dove, which means that we will remove some eggs from the field shortly to hand here it in the captivity to protect it from stochastic events as fire. And thus we can increase the population nature uh, in future. We are now using the Blue Iron Ground Doves action plan to guide our actions in the field and also to raise the funds and we expect to initiate the captive program and harvest its first results in the next two years. A conservation project, however, is not only about the species, but also with the community where the species lives. And this is why we promote local tourism, talks and meetings, education activities and bird watching as an engagement too. This project is only possible due to the support of valuable donors and partners, especially in American Bird Conservancy, and of course, our team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. The Blue Eyed Ground Dove is definitely a story that is incredibly motivating and exciting and one that, you know, I think really speaks to why conservationists do what they do. So we're now going to move into the question and answer portion of this webinar. So if I can ask all of the speakers to turn on their videos and microphones, this is the time for all of us to talk. During the webinar registration, we did ask for questions coming in um, from, uh, from the viewers. And so we'll start with some of those, uh, especially ones that were the most frequently asked. And then we'll move into some of the ones that were asked live during the webinar here. Um, I just want to put up on the screen, again, if we don't get to your question or you have follow-up questions, please feel free to check out the ABC website where we will have all of the information that we've shared today along with future updates and exciting stories. You can also find us on social media and we also have an email address if you, if you wanna get in touch with us more, more directly. But we're gonna start off with some of the questions now and I think Albert is still with us. If you can turn on your video and mic, please. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're just important because the first question is for you. <laughs> okay. um, and and that is, um, we're hoping that you can speak a little bit more about the relationship and knowledge of the local communities in finding these lost birds. Okay. Um, we have said we believe that spe uh, saving species from the brink of extinction is not only about the species. Conservation to us is about the people that are related uh, to the species. We do believe that conservation success is only achieved with uh, the support of people. Humans tend to care the most about what we know, and that's why I look for um, like community engagement. And one good example of uh, discovering new appearances are of, of the blue and ground of in Botumirim. It um, happens to following a hint by a local dweller that informed our field team. Uh, and we look for it and find the species. Sometimes the last uh, species um, is lost by science and not for the people who share the species habitat. Thank you. John, can you tell us a little bit more about the threats that lost birds specifically face and how that impacts their status as lost birds? Yeah, thank you, Jordan. I think that's a, uh, a great question. Um, and there are a couple of different situations that you see with lost birds. I mean, there's one similar to what Eliana was describing with the Sinu parakeet, where a lot of the bird's habitat has already been lost. And so there it's pretty clear that this species could be lost. There's sort of direct threats that are obvious there. You also have examples of, of birds that are lost because they may be in areas that just not many people visit and it may look like the habitat there is mostly intact. So you may be sort of wondering, well, you know, if they're on some uh, isolated mountain somewhere which has a lot of forest, then shouldn't they be fine? And sometimes that can be true, but I think it's really important to be aware that often that's, that's not the case. You know, particularly we have threats right now with climate change. So there can be habitat changes that happen even in areas that may look undisturbed. And then also a really significant threat is around invasive species. So one thing that really jumped out to me as we started doing this was around a third, so about around one in three of the birds that come out as lost are from Oceania. So that's islands in the Pacific and New Guinea. And for those of you who know a lot about bird conservation or bird extinction, you'll know that about 90% of all birds have gone extinct from oceanic islands. So if you have a, you know, a pattern where there's a lot of lost birds on oceanic islands, that suggests that some of these birds could really be at risk and that you know, it's, it's a, there's an urgent need for us to go out and try and find them. Thanks, John. Eliana, can you tell us a little bit more about how people can get involved and support these efforts? Um, yeah, um, so I think there, there are many ways um, that people can get involved. Um, I don't know if you, some of you had the chance already to read the note about the black babbler. Actually, it was a couple of locals that found the species and they were the one that shared this information with the ornithologist and um, let's say the experts in birds. So I think uh, one important thing that people can do out there is just sharing the information and the sightings you have. There are many apps available. Um, John mentioned it, eBird is very famous and is the most uh, used by birders in the world, I will say. Uh, but there are also others like iNaturalist that if you don't know what it is, you can post a picture and other people can identify it. So that is one thing um, I think is really cool. It allows the, the participation of the community. Um, also, I think that staying in touch like with the organizations in general, like learning what is happening, uh, following social media, sharing this information to other people. So you can do like outreach of what is happening with this species is also a good way to do that. And I think that if you have the opportunity, if you have the chance uh, supporting these organizations through uh, donations is a great way to do it because um, in countries like Colombia, a couple of hundreds or thousands of dollars can make a big difference and can make, um, for example, the Sinu Parakee expedition a reality. So yeah, I, I, maybe I'm missing, maybe there's more ways to do this, but those are uh, the things that came to my mind. 
No, that's great. Thank you, Eliana. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, so the next question, it's it's a multi-part question about, again, the local communities and the impact of this work and finding these birds on them. So Albert, maybe you can speak about the blue-eyed ground dove more specifically and the impact of that. Uh, Eliana, maybe you can speak more to the sinew parakeet expedition right now. Uh, folks are asking if this will um, raise concerns or how we will keep the location of these really special birds private or secret. Um, so Eliana and Albert, if you could speak to that. Albert, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, I believe that there are positive and negative impacts depending on how things are made. And a good example of positive impact of tourism, it's its uh, economic return, like it happens in Botomini with the presence of the Blue Line Grand Dove. Uh, we received more than 300 uh, tourists uh, from around the world to see the species. And the tourists remain in the city to, 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 see, to see other other species as well. And it helps us project the projects and species to justify their importance in an economical society. Yeah. The local communities also could receive different forms of uh, recognition to be part of the conservation of nature. And it starts usually a process of change for best in society. Thank you, Eliana. Um, yeah, like I mentioned before in the expedition for the Sinu Parakeet, the local community is like a big part of this. Uh, they are not only the guides, but they are also the reason the whole team could go to the area in a safe way. Because um, let's say the peace agreement is signed, but that doesn't mean that everywhere in Colombia is completely safe. So the fact that the local community is involved is a reason that all these 14 people from different organizations in Colombia could um, go. Um, and I think that's um, also the answer for all the concerns raising about like, well, how are you going to avoid that poaching of, of the bird if, if it is found? Um, these people, they, they weren't hide hired for, for guiding the expedition. They live there, they are committed with the conservation. Um, some of them even say that they might have seen the species, but they are not sure because it was like a similar kind of parrot. So um, I think the local community is um, commit with the conservation of the area. And they are probably are going to be, or like the first line of defense in these cases to avoid this kind of situations. Thank you. John, maybe you can speak a little bit more to why this work is so important. How does it actually benefit us to find lost birds? Um, that's a, uh, a roundup of some questions coming in right now during the live chat. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good question. And there's obviously many ways to answer that. And it, it sort of depends on who who's the us that you're talking about. I think Albert and Eliana made some great points there. And, and I've seen some really good points mentioned in the, in the chat as well, that often there can be some really great benefits to, uh, to local communities where these birds are found, right? You can develop um, tourism infrastructure, for example, you develop conservation programs. And when done correctly, you know, discoveries of lost birds and, and the conservation programs around them can really be a big boost for local people in a lot of areas. I think for us personally, this is also kind of about our, our place on earth, right? And I don't want to get too, go too far down this, this direction, but uh, you know, I think we have an obligation to make sure that species don't go extinct. And many times these lost birds are the ones that are most at risk of disappearing. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to kind of do what we can to try and save them. And of course, every other bird species that we can. Thank you. We're going to go back to Albert and the blue-eyed ground of uh, with the next question. Uh, there was a lot of curiosity about the captive rearing project. So if you could tell us more about that as well as um, maybe more broadly, and, and Eliana and John can jump in as well, but regarding small populations and how viable these species are, um, especially if you only find one or two individuals. Oops, uh, this is a good question. Um, 
Although we have been working with these species for the last years, we just found 33 individuals until now. So um, hand rearing project is urgent. And we are working with some partners, including Joe, uh, including Ben Fallon, who is watching us uh, here from Brazil, with Parque, Parque das Aves Institution in Foz do Iguaçu. They are a zoo and will help us with this project. Uh, the viability of the population is hard to know, but we need to do something and we need to do something um, uh, now. Uh, we were looking for this species in several um, expeditions and we're using the, these model of predicted areas and we are not uh, seeing the, the, the species in other sites. They could be there, but until now, all we have is the information we, we, we have in the hands. So uh, starting this, um, the population captivity in the next years, we have some questions to answer before uh, take too much risks. Uh, and only in the future, in the nearby future, we, we're going to know if the actions that we are choosing are the best ones. Uh, but other species have told us that we cannot just be watching uh, the species going extinct in front of our eyes. So we believe, our, we believe actually that we need to try it and the chances are good because the species, we, we are watching the species reproducing in, in the field. So we may have the chance uh, working with uh, dove specialists around the world to, to, to bring the best practice to save the species. Thank you, Albert. John, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I might just quickly add on that one. It's that I think, you know, there are actually quite a few examples in, in conservation of species that were down to even just two or three individuals and have managed to make remarkable comebacks. And so I, I think there's really, there's not a specific point where you should give up on a bird. You know, I think that's, that might, that might be part of the question there, but I think given the examples that we have of cases that seemed hopeless and amazingly they've managed to, to rebound. Um, I think it's really critical for us to, to try whenever possible to, uh, to protect species, even if their, their populations are incredibly low. Thank you. John, actually the next question is for you. <laughs> um, can you walk us through the process of you know being out there in the field maybe you're a everyday birder um you know you're not on an expedition but how do you actually know that you found a lost bird uh for some of these species that haven't been found for 50 100 almost 200 years uh can you tell us about how someone would actually be able to verify or or look up that information well, I think, thanks Jordan. I think that's a great question. And, uh, and it's one that there's, there's sort of no real easy answer to. And, and, and the part I will say is that actually, and this is one of the things I enjoy a lot about lost birds is as you start to hear about how these birds have been rediscovered, there's a whole range of incredible stories about how it happened. So sometimes birds that have been missing for decades or centuries, you know, they sort of get found by accident. Often it's someone who doesn't even really know what they're looking for. Maybe they just sort of think, oh, this thing's strange. Uh, they happen to take a picture of it that happens to get shared with somebody else. Or sometimes these birds sort of happen to show up, you know, one's caught as a pet somewhere and someone's walking around a, uh, a market and they see this bird and they're like, oh my God, what is, what, what is this thing? Um, and then of course, at the other end of the spectrum, there are examples where people are really specifically looking for something and they know exactly what they're trying to find. Uh, and in the moment that they see it, they have this incredible eureka moment. It's like, oh my gosh, there it is. Um, but I would say, you know, I'd say two things on that. One, you know, Eliana mentioned them, iNaturalist and eBird. There's some great resources out there for, you know, if someone gets a picture of something that you're not sure what it is, you can uh, just share it. And there are a lot of experts who can help you out with that. I also um, hinted at it before in my talk, but we are working on developing this web platform We'll send everyone on this uh, who's in this webinar an email when that goes live. But basically, part of what we're going to put out there is a lot of information as much as we can about what these lost birds are, what they look like, and where they might be. And so hopefully that can be a resource for, for anyone who's interested to get a little more information about, uh, about these birds. Thank you. Can you just uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when a new species or, or 
when a species has been refound. Uh, typically, a scientific manuscript is then peer reviewed and published. So these are also valid claims being made. Um, so I just want to, if you could speak to that as well, um, you know, these are such important discover rediscoveries that um, we definitely make sure that the science is supportive of these. Yeah, of, of course. That's a that's a great point. Um, you obviously don't want to want to jump the gun and, and uh, think that something's been found when it hasn't been. As you mentioned there, Jordan, there's there's a process of scientific review um, that's often used. I mean, that was the case with this black browed babbler. You know that there was a photograph taken of it, and there's a paper that's just been published. So there've been a lot of people who have confirmed that that's definitely a rediscovery. We have the advantage nowadays that so many people have digital cameras or cell phones that can take pictures, more often than not, you're able to get a, a photo to kind of confirm what something is. But, you know, there's, there's some challenges here because there is always a gray zone where you get reports of species, maybe someone didn't happen to have a camera with them and you think, oh, maybe that's it, maybe it's not. Um, so yes, I think it, you gotta be careful that you don't uh, make any official announcements or start doing any conservation actions until you get a definite confirmation, but, uh, there also are sort of rumors and stories that are often worth, worth following up on. So just to reiterate too, in terms of how can we all go on these expeditions, it starts by just going birding, right? So as long as you're out there in nature, uh, just searching, it's a treasure hunt for anyone. Um, and these expeditions are simply uh, experts that are targeting different areas that are possible for the birds, correct? Eliana, do you wanna? There's a lot of people wishing they were in Colombia right now, <laughs> self-included. I would like to be in Colombia too, I'm actually in Minnesota. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, is I think it's totally true. Like um, the example of the blue eye ground of the black grab babbler, like these are, I mean, some people will say like, oh, but I don't have a lost bird in my, backyard <laughs> maybe maybe not but maybe if you go to a little forest that is five miles away from your house you can find something that has not that maybe is not uh really score but maybe has not been recorded that before <laughs> so i don't know i think all the information we can get out of these species and share is very valuable and that's also one of the reasons that the expedition in in Alto Sinu right now is not only looking for the parakeet. They are trying to get information of everything they can. And I'm pretty sure they're going to bring awesome um, new records of birds that we didn't know they were there. So share, share, use eBird and INAT. Thanks, Eliana. Uh, Gordon, if I could just quickly yeah. follow up on that one, I think it, just adding to Eliana's point there, you know, the lost birds that we're describing here are kind of like the most extreme examples, but there's really a lot of ways at more local levels where there's sort of, you know, these local mysteries and ways that people can really find new information and, uh, and help contribute. And that could even be something like whether it might be a common bird in one area, but who knows maybe if, if it breeds in the particular state or county where you happen to live. So we're hoping to put more of that information out there, but it's, it's important to point out, I think that you know, there's a lot of opportunities to find information that's really relevant, that's sort of more local than the than these extreme lost birds. That's a great point too. Um, and actually leads into a really interesting question coming in from the chat um, about very rare species that haven't been lost, um, but how do we prevent from losing them, um, especially because we are talking about that loss of observations, not necessarily the, the extinction, right? The word that we all don't wanna say, um, but that we're trying to prevent. So I don't know if anyone, John, if you wanna uh, follow up on that. And personally, I just, I, I think I would just jump in and say, it's all about just getting out there and recording those observations and continuing to search um, with a different perspective. but. Again, if any of you want to jump in. Yeah, sure. I, I think that that question about extinction is, is you know, also one that Albert touched on a little bit and that's something like the blue-eyed ground of now it's no, it's no longer lost, but 
it's critically endangered still. And we're dealing with a tiny number of individuals. And you know, even when you have that information, it's really important to focus on ways to try and try and protect species and prevent them going extinct. So I think you, you want to make sure that you're not getting distracted from the birds that we know are out there and are really endangered um, and, and only think about the lost birds, right? And I would like to, to comply with the John uh, comments. And I believe the rare birds uh, has something that humans uh, really like that is the affection for the rare. And sometimes we have this species like the blue iron dove that is in a very protected area. And with this highlighted, this flagship species, we we have the opportunity to, to actually protect a lot of other birds that is inside uh, the, the, same, the same, same area. And sometimes a lot of uh, these birds are endangered. So it's, it's like a trade-off uh, between to look and um, prioritize the rare birds and the most endangered, but it's, it's, it's kind of uh, case by case, I mean. Thanks, Albert. Um, some folks are wondering more about some personal opinions, so feel free to chime in and not to put you on the spot. But is there a lost bird that you would most like to find? And since I don't have pictures, if you could describe it. And also, do you have an example of a lost bird that has made a remarkable recovery? So obviously we just heard about the black-browed babbler today. Um, we need conservation efforts to help that bird, so more to that story. But is there another species maybe that has had uh, the success of, of the blue-eyed ground dove in terms of uh, continuing to grow that population? So again, which, which lost bird would you most like to find? And please describe it. And then which one has had uh, a really good success story? Um, I, to be honest, I don't know about the lost birds. I think John knows more <laughs> about these than me. Maybe he can answer that. Um, but I want to mention the yellow ear um, parrot in Colombia. Um, I don't know if it was officially lost for science, but the population was as low as 80 individuals. Um, so everybody at some point, you, we stopped seeing the birds in Colombia and it's like, okay, where, where are they? Um, and actually right now the population, if I'm not wrong, is over 2,500 individuals. So it is a huge, it was a huge recovery. There is a lot of work behind this made by Fundacion Pro Aves and other partners in Colombia. Um, so I think it, I mean, it wouldn't, I, I think there's way much more examples. I just thought of that because we're, I'm talking about parrots, but, but um, I think it is a good example. I read in the chat that the people is also mentioning uh, the condor uh, in California. So that's a good example too. So I think there is, there is a lot of chances and John already mentioned, like we shouldn't give up in a species just because the population is, is low or because we think it cannot make it. Sure, I'll jump in here. I think Eliana, your example of the parrot is a great one. Um, you know, I'm I'm just sort of looking at at our uh, our Zoom backgrounds here, and I think you know, blue-eyed ground dove, Antiochia brush finch. Um, there are quite a few examples of birds that have come back after being lost, and. Uh, and you should check out the ABC website because we actually highlight a few of them there. Um, I, I can provide a, I, right, I immediately know the answer to the which lost bird do you want to find? And uh, I don't have to describe it too much to you because it's the Makira moorhen, that bird that I showed the, the picture of and the map of. And, and that bird has really sort of started my, you know, it, it was the inspiration for my whole interest in lost birds. Uh, and I've actually been to Makira and spent three months in an area called Makira's weather coast trying to find that bird. Uh, we did not find it, but we have plans to go back next year. So hopefully there is still more to that story. Um, so if I could find lost, uh, one lost bird, Makira Moorhen would be it with, uh, with no question. And to tell you the truth, I would love to find more of the blind ground of <laughs> in different regions of the country. 
uh, we need uh, new flagships for protecting the Cerrado biome here in Brazil. But John has shown us the Kinglet Caliptura here in Brazil. My species was uh, common in some museums and was not seen like forever <laughs> would be a species to, to get, uh, that I would like to find, of course. And one of the stories that I like the most about the bring back birds for an extinction is the case of the, um, the black robin in the New Zealand that came from just five individuals and now it's a, 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 a safe, safe condition. So uh, we have some good examples also from uh, other, other parts of the world to, to to conserve our our species. Thank you. I'll just point out that people are throwing some great examples of lost birds they'd like to find into the into the chat there. I just saw Glaucus macaw, and uh, you know, I think I think all of us would probably be really excited to find ivory billed woodpecker. That would just be a a bird watching bird watching chaos in America if somebody found that. Well, I'm conscientious of time, so we're just going to have one. One other uh, question before we wrap up for today, and that is, uh, other than the species, are there any uh, concrete expeditions or other projects? Maybe it's more uh, captive rearing or other uh, biology aspects to projects. Uh, what are you most excited about um, in the rest of 2021 <laughs> and 2022? I'll start with John. Um, that's a great question. I think you, you guys have probably all figured out here that I'm, I'm a real lost birds enthusiast. So I'm obviously biased towards being very excited about any, any, uh, you know, field programs around those. I think one thing that I'd like to really emphasize around those, that I think so important is, you know, often, often these birds, you don't find these birds. And I think one of the things that's most exciting is the ways that you can use the searches to generate really important conservation outcomes, even if you don't find the bird. So Eliana made a great example there. as She described, you know, the other species that they're finding. Um, so you can think of these as ways to, to find a whole set of other poorly known species. And often you can, uh, you can help start conservation projects just by this search, whether or not the bird's actually there. So, you know, I think maybe Slightly dodging the question there, but I, I'm, uh, you know, I love the idea of lost birds, and and I think that's a real, that would definitely be top of the list for me. Eliana, do you want to go? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think finding the species and looking for the species is super cool and very important. But I, I'm, like, most of my life, <laughs> my professional life, I have been like dedicated to study the ecology and the natural history and the interactions between species and the habitat. So for me, that's like the most cool <laughs> and most interesting stuff. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm curious, for example, if they found a single parakeet, like where are they living right now? If they are not in those dry forests that are not around anymore, where are they nesting? How many they are? Um, I think there's like, if we get the check, it is there, what is going to happen after, like what we can figure out about it, the questions are endless. So um, yeah, I think it's very interesting. I'm waiting to see what happened and hopefully they are around. I'm definitely as curious as you. Uh, Albert, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, I'm definitely hoping um, for the best for the species for the blind ground dove in this year. We, um, we have a good um, reproductive season this year that turns to uh, uh, being very um, optimistic about the species. But I'm foreseeing the, the time when the species is safe in the way that we can uh, look for the other species, the protected, protect other species in Brazil. Brazil actually is the number one in the world with the most threatened birds, we have a lot of concerns and a lot of other birds to, to protect it. So of course, I, I, I love the, the blind ground the project. I love the species. I want it to be safe and the community to, to take care of the species by themselves. And after, after that, I, we need to, to look after the other species that is a lot of uh, critical endangered uh, and lost species in Brazil. So we have a lot of work to do. 
Thanks, Albert. I'm just going to put the website for American Bird Conservancy, our social media, and that email address on the screen now. Unfortunately, I need to close out this webinar now. I want to thank John, Eliana, and Albert again for being our speakers. There's so much fascinating uh, birds and stories here, so I encourage everyone watching to definitely follow along. And again, all of this is on our website, so if anyone needs more information or has questions, don't hesitate to reach out. But again, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. And John, Eliana, and Albert, I hope we keep finding more birds. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you, Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.